Hi everyone, my name is Mark and I'm a sanitarian in food protection. Today, we are gonna be giving an overview of a food service establishment inspection. Now, a good inspection starts before you even enter the facility. A good inspection starts with a file review where you look through the previous inspection reports and see what's been cited in the past. A menu review will also be very helpful to know what type of food preparation is going to be happening. Once you review the file, the menu, and hours of operation, it's time to pack your bag. What do you bring to a food inspection? Well, you have to bring a metal stem probe thermometer to take temperatures of food products, alcohol wipes to ensure that the metal stem of the thermometer is sanitary and sanitized when you put it into food, a trusty flashlight for those dimly lit crevices in a food service establishment, paper and a pen for note taking, test strips to make sure that sanitizing solution is at the proper concentrations, proper identification to identify that you are with the health department, sub part 14-1 of the New York State Sanitary Code for reference along with other uh, environmental health manual references. And of course, when you finish the inspection, you need to write up a report, a tablet, laptop, or even a paper inspection report would be suffice to provide to the operator. Now, I'm gonna go pack my bag and we're gonna get started on the inspection. Let's go. Inspections are performed unannounced. This means operators and staff are unaware that an inspection will be taking place until an inspector arrives and identifies themselves. When entering a facility, ask to speak to the individual who oversees the establishment. Let the manager or operator know you're here to perform an inspection produce identification, and inform them that the inspection will begin immediately. During the inspection, an inspector will diligently observe and evaluate food worker hygiene, how food is stored, prepared, handled, and served. Conditions of the facility will also need to be evaluated. This includes, but not limited to, floors, walls, ceilings, shelving, exterior of cookland equipment, and preparation surfaces. Other areas that need to be assessed are bathrooms, dining areas, plumbing, hot holding units, coolers, freezers, garbage areas, and dishwashing areas. Complete a walkthrough of the entire establishment to start the inspection process. During this initial walkthrough, look for obvious signs of public health hazards that would need to be addressed immediately. Be on the lookout for signs of illness, instances of bare hand contact, improper cooking and cooling, obvious signs of temperature abuse, and anything that is dynamic in nature and is cause for concern. Once the initial walkthrough is complete and all identified hazards have been addressed, make your way to the hand washing station in the kitchen. By washing your hands, you set a good example for staff and ensure that you are not a source of contamination while inspecting. Hand washing also offers the opportunity to see if the facility has adequate hot and cold water soap, and single-service paper towels. Use this time to talk to the operator when possible. Asking simple questions will give insight to the daily operations of the establishment. Has it been busy today? Run into any problems lately? How's staffing going? Noting a facility's busy times can help you determine a workable amount if a portion of potentially hazardous food is observed out of temperature control at the cook line. Asking about recent problems may uncover certain parts of the establishment that you wish to pay particularly close attention to. Asking about staffing may lead to information of ill workers and a chance to review their ill worker policy. Now, it's time to check food preparation areas. You will want to spend a good amount of time inspecting and observing the cook line as most cooking and food handling processes take place in this area. Take final cooking temperatures of potentially hazardous food and discuss probe thermometer use with the operator. Ensure the operator's thermometer is calibrated properly by placing your thermometer and theirs into an ice water bath. Probe thermometers must be able to read temperatures within a plus or minus two degrees of actual temperatures. Calibrate thermometers accordingly. Take note of the following minimum cooking temperatures, poultry 165, pork 150, rare roast beef 130, 
shell eggs, 145, ground meat, 158, reheating of potentially hazardous food, 165, pre-cooked potentially hazardous food from commercially processed hermetically sealed containers, 140, and hot holding, 140. Check to ensure all surfaces are clean and in good condition. Surfaces within the food service establishment must be smooth and easily cleanable, especially food contact surfaces. Scan the floors, walls, and ceilings and check under and behind equipment for cleanliness and good condition. Ensure sanitizing buckets contain an acceptable concentration of sanitizer. Chemicals used for sanitizing are not to have concentrations which will leave toxic residues on surfaces treated. Test strips should be available to measure the parts per million concentrations of the solution. Wet cloths used for cleaning are to be stored in the sanitizing solution between uses. When inspecting coolers, you will want to verify food is obtained from an approved source and that it is properly stored. Food that is not actively cooling should be kept covered with a tight-fitting lid and stored at a minimum of 6 inches off the ground. Be sure to check temperatures of several potentially hazardous foods in each cooler. Cold holding should be kept at 45 degrees or below at all times. If you find a potentially hazardous food not at proper temperatures, you must interview the operator to determine if and what the corrective action should be. You can refer to the Environment, Environmental Health Manual for Guidance, CEHFP 854, is a great tool to refer to. Food not subject to further washing or cooking should be stored and protected against cross-contamination, above and away from raw food products. Check for cleanliness and condition of racks and shelving, and properly shielded adequate lighting. Dry storage areas should be kept in good condition. Chemicals should be stored away from food to protect the food from contamination. Chemical containers, such as spray bottles, should always be labeled with the contents of the container. Check for signs of pests and rodents and note any possible entrance areas. Also, ensure all pest control application is completed by a licensed exterminator. An indirect drain is a waistline that does not connect directly with the drainage system. An indirect drain discharges liquid waste through an air break into an improved plumbing fixture directly connected to the drainage system. Indirect drains are required for any drains originating from fixtures and equipment used for storage, preparation, or processing of food. Ice machines, ice wells, and food preparation sinks are all examples of locations where an indirect drain is required. A review of dishwashing and dishwashing facilities is important. A three-compartment setup is required for manual dishwashing, and the inspector should review that the operator has adequate facilities and understands the process of wash, rinse, sanitize, and air dry. If the facility has a mechanical dishwasher, the dishwasher needs to be operated in an accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Instructions should include minimum wash and rinse temperatures and required sanitizing concentrations for low temperature machines. The gauges on the dishwasher need to be functional. Dishwashing facilities should be large enough to accommodate the largest piece of equipment that will need to be washed. A facility can use manual or mechanical dishwashing and is not required to have both. A check of the bathroom facilities is part of the inspection and includes a check to see that sinks and toilets are functional and in good condition, and that hand wash sinks are equipped with hot and cold or tempered water, soap, hand drying devices, and a hand wash sign. The bathroom needs to be in good repair with a self-closing door fixture and women's facility equipped with covered garbage receptacles. The garbage area should be checked to ensure that the area is properly maintained. Containers and dumpsters have tightly fitting lids and are closed when actively not in use. A walk outside the facility may lead to other discoveries, such as sewage issues or exterior fans creating a nuisance. Mop sinks should be easily accessible. Ensure mop sink hoses do not serve as a cross connection.
Check to see that an up-to-date permit is posted in the facility, along with an allergy poster, choking poster, and hand wash signs. If any required items are missing, educate the operator on where signage can be obtained and the requirement of where to post it. Once you have completed the inspection and have ensured that all public health hazards have been identified and corrected, it is time to document the inspection using MobyTask or paper inspection form. All violations need to be clearly documented and include who, what, where, when, and why. A cited violation should not leave the reader with more questions than answers. An inspector must go over the inspection report with the operator, answering questions and providing education as necessary. The operator should sign the inspection report. If an operator is irate or unwilling to sign a report, it is important that you contact your supervisor for guidance. Inspection reports should never be modified following the inspection without the operator's knowledge. If an inspection report requires modification, seek proper guidance from your supervisor. Lastly, inspection reports should be provided to the operator as soon as possible, typically by the close of business. Some instances may require you submit the following business day. In conclusion, it is important to always remember that our job is to protect public health and safety. When reviewing possible violations, ask yourself, what is the public health significance? Thank you.